Good evening to each of you. Thank you for being here tonight, as well as to those of you online and by a conference call. We surely miss uh, seeing some of you, but we know sickness and other hindrances that you're probably not enjoying either keep you from being here. But we hope you can be back with us very uh, soon. But John mentioned, as did Frank, and I join uh, with them both in extending our uh, sympathy to our sister Sue and Brother Rufus's children and his passing. Uh, he met death with confidence and with hope, which is the same way that all of us uh, should meet it, and through Christ we can. And uh, his spot is now empty as I look back there, uh, see him in my mind's eye. But we long, as John mentioned, for that day when again we can see him uh, once more uh, with our Savior in glory. And that is uh, the hope that all of us have. That's why we're here tonight, because Jesus is all the world to us. But we'll be mindful of uh, their family in the days, certainly, that lie ahead. Big words. We've talked about those on the second uh, Sunday nights this year, at least as our schedule has permitted. I know it's kind of been chaotic with things changing back and forth, but big words. We typically think of their length, the number of letters. That's what makes them a big word. Well, a letter of 19 uh, or a word of 19 letters, incomprehensibility, the fact of being impossible to understand. A lot of those words seem like if they're big, that's maybe a necessary attribute or characteristic. They're just hard to understand. And yet we've tried to look at the Bible and find there are some big words, but some words that have big meanings and that are very important for our understanding of what God would have us to know. And tonight, uh, there's a big word, but it only has five letters. So you may say that's not really a big word at all. But I would submit to you, perhaps, it might be at least among the top two or three of the biggest words in Scripture as it relates to the actual idea and thought behind it. Let me show you what I mean. Notice how the, uh, the curtain pulls back here. That's purposefully to try to show you putting this word in the spotlight. The word is glory. Glory. I don't know what you think of when you hear that word glory. If you're hungry, you might be thinking of glory green beans. They sell those at the grocery store and they're pretty tasty, well seasoned. I still prefer the homegrown variety. Uh, glory, it might be something that you associate uh, with your past. Uh, maybe a time, uh, a lot of us, uh, the older we get, the better athletes we were. If you don't know how that works, you didn't play ball long enough. But the older I get, the better I was at various sports that I played uh, in grade school and high school. Uh, my middle school year, eighth grade, um, we were a successful team. One contest out of how many ever we played that year. In other words, we won one game. One, that's singular, one, only one and uh, I played post, so that tells you something about it. That's where the tall guys are supposed to play. I was about as tall then as I am now. Didn't grow a lot in high school. But anyways, we won one game that year at Fox Middle School. And it didn't look like we were going to win that game, but we hung in tough to the end. And sure enough, we were down by a point with just a few seconds left. The coach called to play, and wouldn't you know it was to come to me. Or at least uh, that's the way I remember it. Maybe nobody else was open. Nevertheless, they passed it to me. I turned around on the left block. I can still see the little gymnasium there at Fox Middle School. And I released the ball. And it's true what they say. Those of you that have played know what I'm talking about. It's like everything's in slow motion, and the ball just, you know, arcs through the air. And sure enough, it hits off the backboard, and we actually had a wooden backboard. That's how old school uh, that middle school was. Not even fiberglass, not even see-through. A clear or a wooden backboard hit the backboard and fell straight through the rim, through the net. Uh, the buzzer sounds. We win the game. Everybody goes crazy. That's the one game we win that year, and I was the hero. And so uh, that was a moment of glory. And those of you, like I said, that played sports, maybe you can relive some of those moments in your own experience and past. Well, for some of you, uh, maybe uh, you ladies, you didn't have that experience necessarily with sports. Uh, one of my favorite parts uh, about doing a wedding is that moment, of course, when you get to see uh, all of the preliminaries take place and maybe there's some lighting of candles or there's, uh, you know, the ring bearer and the little girl throwing flower petals, uh, sometimes, you know, not really cooperating like they should. Uh, but then there's that grand moment. Everybody knows what's about to happen. It's my task. If I'm officiating, I ask everyone to stand. Usually there's some closed doors or a curtain again. There's something that's blocking the view in the back. But everyone stands and turns. They're looking for what? They're waiting for the bride. Some of you ladies, you can remember that moment. The doors swing open. And you're seen for the very first time. You've got your hair all in the right places. Uh, every fingernail is painted the right color. You know, uh, the dress is perfect. Everybody's there to see you. And uh, that's a special moment. That's a moment, if you will, of somewhat, we might say, a glorious uh, moment. And a lot of pictures through the years, of course, the photographer tries to capture if they're 
really skilled. They'll try to capture the bride right at that moment as well as the groom. And I'm usually sitting there with a smirk on my face just looking at him. You know, I just want to see his reaction. And that's exciting. Well, what do we mean by glory? We don't mean that when we come to the Bible. Uh, although the Bible talks about weddings and marriage, I guess, for sure. And trying to think of, if you go back to Genesis 2, what Adam must have felt when Eve was presented. We know what he says. He said, whoa, man, that's what I've been looking for. You know, so he was excited for sure. He didn't play sports. But what is glory all about? It's a Bible word. Here's one definition. You might not like it, so improve it. And I'll be happy to use your definition the next time. The glory of God is the magnificence, worth, loveliness, and grandeur of His many perfections, which He displays in His creative and redemptive acts in order to make His glory known to those in His presence. That's wordy, I realize, but like I said, if you can improve it, please do it, and I'll use it and give, it, uh, give you the credit uh, the next time we go. But that's kind of about the best that we can do when we talked about the glory of God, His magnificence. A word that I didn't put in that definition that would certainly be fitting that's overused today is this word, awesome. The glory of God is awesome. In awesome, you see that little word, awe. We even sing the song, whatever number it is in our books. I stand, speaking of us as worshipers, to God as we praise Him, I stand in awe of you. I'm amazed at you. God, you are awe-inducing. You are indeed awesome. And that's how we should use the word. We shouldn't use it for cheeseburgers or a movie or some other silly thing in life, even though we often do. We said, man, that was awesome. There's only one thing in the entire universe that is truly awesome if we understand it, and that's God and God alone. And the Bible clearly teaches that. Now, why is that a big idea? Because from cover to cover, as well as even outside of Scripture, glory confronts us. And if we can just catch a glimpse of it, uh, sometimes we even talk about uh, the glory of preaching. Preaching is glorious. Not because you can talk and everyone else has to listen. That's not the point. Not because everyone's looking here. Uh, that's not the point either. Just as we spoke of this morning, the glory of preaching is speaking God's words after Him. Thinking God's thoughts after Him. Delivering to people something of a glimpse of the glory of God that you have been able to see. That perhaps you can pull the curtain back and say, look at that. Look at the glory of God. And hope that they will have the same excitement that you do. That's the glory of preaching. What do we mean? Uh, the primary Hebrew term in the Old Testament for glory is the Hebrew word kabod. And uh, that's probably meaningless to most of us. But it's a word that interestingly means, comes from a stem that means weight or heaviness. The glory of God, the weight or the heaviness of something. But if you ponder that for a moment, maybe you can kind of see the inside of maybe why God chose to use that word to describe His glory, a word meaning weight or heaviness. It's an awareness. Um, we always, you know, think of when we lift something. It's, it's very easy to tell. It just only takes a moment to say, is this light or heavy? And uh, most of us have watched uh, our children when they were little and just beginning to walk and motor about. Uh, they like to, of course, imitate dad and mom. And if they see dad or mom carrying something from one place to the next, they very quickly imitate that behavior. And uh, they'll pick it up and they'll, heavy, heavy. You know, they, they're unable to do it. Uh, but they want to do it. But they recognize their limitations in doing it. And as we get older, maybe there's a brief period of time uh, in our mid to late teenage years. And then for a few decades where our strength is sufficient, we can do pretty much where we, uh, what we want to do. And, you know, heavy things are not a problem. But then... Age continues to creep in, bursitis in my shoulder, reared its head on my uh, week last week, and now anything that's heavy, I, I notice it too. It's heavy. It, it's something that I don't have the capability to handle on my own. I acknowledge it as its uh, heaviness or its weight. It causes me to stop. So God in His glory, His weight, His heaviness, the awareness of His awesome nature. In the New Testament, the Greek term is the word doxa. And of interest here, Greek is usually a very technical, specific uh, language, but here uh, the Greek language doesn't help us as much as it does in other places. In secular Greek, the word referred to an opinion or a conjecture, uh, repute, your reputation. It could also refer to praise or fame. And you might remember Paul, for instance, in 1 Corinthians, talks about that there were some who were striving after a crown of glory. A crown of glory, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He's talking about the Greek athletes. There in Corinth, they most likely, likely participated in the Isthmian Games, the Isthmian Peninsula. But they probably also were aware, of course, of the Olympic Games that continue even to the modern age. 
And those athletes would strive to be victorious, to win in order to receive a crown of glory, which in that day was not a gold medal. It was nothing more than a braided amount of usually either laurel or celery leaves. That makes you want to get up and go running in the morning, doesn't it? You know, just having a crown of celery leaves. Well, but they would be recognized. That's the greatest athlete in all of Greece. And today, still our athletes, uh, even though it's a gold medal and it may have some monetary value for the work that is invested, there's really little that uh, probably even makes a return on that investment. But the idea of glory, that people notice and point and uh, acknowledge he or she is the greatest. But you see, that's what we are doing with God. He is the greatest. Let me give you some other ideas or some other things to consider. The word appears about 375 times in both the Old and the New Testament or total in the Old and New Testament, depending on the version, that might be slightly less or more. Uh, it's interesting that the word can be used in three different manners. God is glorious. Of that, there is no doubt. We'll see that momentarily. That's an adjective. God reveals His glory. That is the noun. That is the very, uh, you know, description of what he is glorious so God reveals his glory and God is to be glorified there is something we do in response so adjective noun and verb the word can be used his glory is both what we say intrinsic and extrinsic uh, something that is intrinsic or inherent means that God's very nature is glorious now, I said this was one or two of the top ideas that the Bible talks about and I stand by that statement and I'm um, uh, know that there are other ideas that you might say, well, doesn't the Bible talk about God's love a lot? Well, it does, no doubt about it. But His love is only understood as really what we might say an expression of His glory. Uh, you might say, well, the Bible talks about God being interested and de uh, being defined as true. His reality is such that He is ultimate in His reality. That's truth. You're right. But again, that's a manifestation of His glory. Uh, you might think about that uh, God is holy. And I would even say perhaps there's some overlap, some uh, maybe interplay between the word holy and glory uh, that, again, I probably think about much more than what you would want me to detail to you tonight. It might become quickly too, uh, too much in that sense that you say, well, I need to think about that myself. But I encourage you to do that. God's holiness, God's gloriness. So it's His nature. It's intrinsic to who He is, to what He is. But it's also extrinsic, that is, to what He does, His works. God is glorious in the things that He does. Let me show you just a few of these things. Psalm 19, verse 1, you know the verse. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. The firmament shows His handiwork. David knew that centuries ago with the unaided eye looking up at the black velvet of a Judean nighttime sky, the diamond stars uh, twinkling thousands, millions of miles away. Today, we peer into space uh, with the advantages of telescopes, both here on this planet as well as even those in orbit that allow us to see galaxies far distant than what David could ever imagine. And still, all that we can say is how glorious, how awesome this is. Exodus 24, we mentioned this episode this morning. The incident when God comes down to Mount Sinai. Notice the Bible says, The glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain. And that's the passage that we said prompted the people to say, Don't let God talk to us. It's too awesome, too amazing for us to hear His voice. Uh, God is awesome in that sense. Later, He would come. The rabbis would coin a term. It's not found in Scripture. But when God, the cloud, would fill the tabernacle, they would speak of the Shekinah glory of God. And the people would know that God's presence was among them. And some of the priests, the select high priest, and uh, those that would attend to him would be able to come near in the high priest into his presence on the Day of Atonement. Uh, that was an amazing, an amazing experience, uh, the glory of God. Uh, later, because of their wickedness, Ezekiel will notice that the glory of God lifts up and departs from the temple. One of the saddest episodes in all of Scripture as God removes His presence from His people. But God is glorious. Jesus is glorious. John chapter 1 verse 14, because He too is God, we beheld His glory. That is, He took on flesh. And when He took on that flesh, John says, we were really able to see, as it were, His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace 
and truth. Later, the next chapter, in fact, John chapter 2, that first miracle he performs at Cana of Galilee, the Bible says changing water to wine was the beginning of his miraculous deeds, and these were done to manifest his glory. Now, I know the debate has raged for, uh, I guess, uh, many, many years uh, on this particular episode, and what did Jesus make? The Bible just simply says he changed water to wine, and uh, you'll find people just burning uh, thousands of acres of trees for the paper that they write saying Jesus made this kind or Jesus made that kind. Here's what I know. He made the best wine that had ever been made. The best wine that had ever been drunk or consumed by any human being Jesus made on that occasion. Of whatever type it was, it matters little. It manifested His glory. It showed Him to be, in fact, the divine Son of God. The Holy Spirit is glorious because He too is God. Uh, Peter says it this way, If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Uh, that's something that we ought to take to heart, even in today's world. When we are opposed for being the people of God and standing for the truth of God and living by the Word of God, and people don't like it, and people make fun, and people ridicule, and people uh, do all types of other things to us, maybe even some of them, it might be the case, coming in years ahead, physical harm to us as some of these early Christians faced. Peter said, you rejoice, you're blessed. The spirit of glory, the people that are opposing you recognize the glory of God and because of their wickedness and evil and their sin, they can't stand it. The spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, so rejoice in that fact. Uh, it's a broad topic. And uh, it's something that the more I study, the more I, I see kind of how it weaves all throughout uh, Scripture. And uh, this is on my list along with about uh, probably hundreds of other things that I want to know more about. And I realize you can kind of get tunnel vision when you study something and uh, kind of get on that hobby horse. I, I don't want to do that with glory, but I thought about it a lot lately. And I want to share just these three ideas with you tonight to be very brief and hopefully to be helpful. Number one, God gives us glory. God, if you want to instead say gives, maybe share would be a word. God gives us glory. He shares with us His glory. Psalm 8 Again, David, just as he did in Psalm 19, he looks up at the sky and he says, All of that, God, you've made. We look around and we see all the amazing things that God has made in our modern world. We pat man on the back and said, look at that magnificent building. We should look at what God has done and say, look, God, at how great you are. But even still, we recognize how great things are. So David says, what is man that you're mindful of him, the son of man that you visit him? We're specks. In the universe, God, compared to your greatness and to your glory, and yet you've taken notice of us. You love us. And uh, he even makes this wonderful statement, repeated in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. You have made, God, you have made him, mankind, human beings, a little lower than the angels. And you have crowned him, mankind, with glory and honor. The Hebrew writer will expressly make that application to Christ. But here in its original context, the psalmist applies it to all of us. We are made in the glory, with the glory of God, in the image of God. I know you read that in Genesis 1, 26. Like you, I've pondered what all that could include. And I uh, don't know and certainly don't want to limit and say it includes all of this, but none of this. I, I don't want to make presuppositions or even pronouncements like that. But to know, as the psalmist said, God has crowned us with glory. Well, where did that glory come from? Not from within me but from Him. And He shared it with me and He shared it with you. And that's why every precious soul you meet is of value and is special. We live in a day and an age. It afflicts, I guess, people of all ages especially, but uh, the longer that we study this, uh, the more that it becomes apparent that it especially happens for so many in their youth. Young people uh, are just, and this has been a trend over the last 40 years, are growing up with no sense of uh, belonging, no sense of uh, their worth, no sense of value. Uh, the psychologist will tell you they need to have self-esteem. And what do they do? Well, they just invent that for themselves. They just look at something they have, maybe the wealth of their parents or some talent they might by chance have possessed and use that. None of those things are proper reasons for our specialness, our uniqueness. Our glory comes from God who shared it with us. And let me tell you, no matter who you are tonight, no matter where you're from, no matter who your parents were, no matter uh, what your family life is like, no matter your social economic background, the home you live in, the clothes you... None of that matters. 
You're special because you're made in the image of God. And he shares His glory with you and He loves you. We are to love you as the same and we are to love one another uh, for the same reason. And so God shares or God gives us His glory. That's an amazing, an amazing thought. Now, uh, we're going to notice just in a moment our response uh, to that. In fact, let's just go ahead and bring that up. We should... And that's in the parentheses there, give glory to God. We give glory to God, or at least we should. If God has shared with us His glory, for what purpose did He do it? Well, uh, so that we can share His glory. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, Paul is in the midst of a debate uh, there with the Corinthian Christians. And uh, like us, they were easily distracted by what you might call the fringe issues, the things that really in the big picture analysis matter very little. And so they wanted to talk about eating and drinking. They wanted to talk about, you know, the culture of their day. And those were not unimportant. Uh, but Paul, I think, takes an interesting approach here to these particular Christians. And it's one that I think we would do well to maybe imitate today uh, when we are sometimes sidetracked by things that might not be as important as some others. And Paul says, uh, by way of conclusion, when he talks about, you know, one of you says this, one of you says that, one of you follows this opinion, one of you follows another. He says, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's what life is about. There's your one purpose. There's your mission statement, whatever you want to call it. The reason that you breathe in air and exhale carbon dioxide and your heart continues to beat is for this reason, and that's it. And if you're doing anything other than that or doing anything else as a priority before doing that, you're not doing what God made you to do. Now, that sounds like an overstatement, I realize, and people say, well, boy, the preacher's kind of wound up to now. That's kind of crazy. You know, life's about a lot of other things. There's so many other responsibilities I have. What kind of world does he live in, God's world? That's where all of us live. So whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God. That's job one. Everything else that I do will fall into place underneath that if I make that my priority. Back in the first chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul, you remember talking to, again, these Christians in Corinth, uh, where there was uh, the battle between the philosophy and the wisdom of men compared to the philosophy and wisdom of God. Paul said there's no contest. God has given us... Your glory, His glory, and so we give it back to Him, and He tells us how to do that through Jesus and the cross. Oh, it's foolishness to people of the world, but uh, the foolishness of God is still wiser than men. And uh, here's how I love this section beginning. This is 1 Corinthians 1, 27. It's not on screen. Here's how Paul ended that sort of argument that he makes. He said, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And just think about the world we live in now and what people consider wise and what people consider foolish. By and large, the great percentage of people would say, what you're doing right now, what I'm doing right now, what we are doing right now, taking an hour out of our Sunday afternoon before the work week begins tomorrow, is foolish. You could be at home with your feet up watching a ball game. You could be uh, fishing. You could be shopping. You could be doing something for you. And yet you're here worshiping a God you can't see. And that you would, uh, or they would say, that you cannot even prove has any existence whatsoever. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. The base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are that, here's the reason why He did it, that no flesh should glory in His presence. Now, wait a minute, preacher. You said we should give glory to God. And now you're saying, if you're reading Paul, Paul said no flesh should glory in His presence. That's what he says. But what does he mean by that? Keep reading the next two verses tell you. But of Him, that is, of God, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that, as it is written, He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. That's why you're here tonight, because you recognize that God has given you glory and made you for the purpose of returning that glory to Him. That's the reason, again, you breathe in air, you exhale carbon dioxide, your heart beats and circulates blood through your body. That's it. 
Isaiah 43 and verse 7, Isaiah uh, is writing as God speaks and God speaks. Isaiah writes, everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory. I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. That's what God told Isaiah to write and he wrote it. It's recorded for us. God has made us for his glory and we should give glory to God. But here's the last point tonight. God will bring us to glory. There's a purpose in what God did in creating us as he did for the purposes uh, that he wishes for us to accomplish. It's for our benefit. Uh, God doesn't, in the final analysis, need any glory from me. Reality, check, but it's true. He is God after all. And no matter whether I choose to obey him or not, whether I choose to give him my worship or not, matters little. He's not going to be diminished in any way from being God. He's not going to be in any way uh, you know, weakened by my failure, but instead having been made for His glory and living for His glory as He created me, then He will do that which He has promised to do and wants to do, that is, bring me to glory. Uh, this, is, this should be Hebrews chapter 2. I forgot to put the First Corinthians passage, so take that out and mark Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. The Hebrew writer says it this way, For it was fitting for Him, for God, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, and bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. What did Jesus do and why? Well, that's what the book of Hebrews, as we said this morning, is about. And although there are many ways to answer that question, as the Hebrew writer gives us ample evidence of what Jesus did and why he is the fulfillment of God's plan, this verse says that it was the purpose that Jesus lived, died, and defeated death to bring many sons there, not just uh, men, and excluding females, or males excluding females, but bring many, all of us, to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. God will bring us to glory. You see Matthew 25, it's verse 31. The Bible says, when the Son of Man will come, you remember, in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, He'll sit on His throne of glory. All the nations will be gathered together before him. He'll separate them, divide them as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The sheep on the right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is yours, heaven, it's glory. And we even sing, I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in what? The glory land way. And good reason, that's what it will be. Those who are on the left, the goats on that day, depart from me. I don't know you. I've often thought, and I know, like, probably like me, you were, especially when you were younger, terrified when the preacher got really loud and said, there's a place that has a lake of fire, fire and brimstone. I didn't know what that was, but that sounded certainly like a place I never wanted to go, and it still does. And I think those descriptions of that terrible place called hell are purposefully terrible so that we'll want to do all that we can to avoid that, and through Christ we will. But of the things that have matured my understanding as I've gotten older about hell uh, includes this. Hell is not a terrible place just because it's fire and brimstone. It, that's bad and true enough. But its terribleness, the awfulness of that place is, it is a place where God is not. Consequently, it is a place where His glory is not found. And it's a place only where those who inhabit it will be consumed by their own self-will. And that's the most terrible, imaginable uh, place uh, that could possibly be. And that's why I want to avoid it at all costs. God will bring us to glory. Jesus will bring us to glory. There's so many other passages uh, that help us understand that. And uh, many of our songs, uh, thankfully, help us in that way. But we'll close with this one tonight. And as we think about, as we said in the opening, even one of our dear loved ones, our departed brother, you see the hope for the Christian as we face death is that uh, leaving this world behind, there is something better. And we get just glimpses of it, just as hell might be described by a lake of fire, suffering, and that might be enough to avoid. Uh, really, if you ask me a place where there is a gate of pearl and a street of gold. Yeah, that sounds pretty neat to visit, but what's the real appeal of heaven? What's the real hook that draws us in? Uh, John gives it to us uh, this way. 
John says, I saw no temple in it. Now remember, he's writing, certainly with his Jewish heritage, writing to people interested in serving God uh, and had that background, no temple in it. And so that would have been very significant. No, we might say church building in it, but not needed. The Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. What do you mean? Can you flip a light switch in heaven? No, you don't need to do that. You don't need a flashlight either. The glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. The nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. It will be the place and the time where finally the glory of God, the radiance and awesomeness of it will be fully experienced. These last two chapters in the last book of God's Word tell us that God will be with us. He will dwell with us and we shall see Him as He is. Now, my mind cannot expand to try to take in all that that might include, but it certainly must mean that His glory I will then be able for the very first time, to fully intake. You see, no one's able to do that. That's why all the passages, we read about Moses at the burning bush. We read about him later in Sinai. Uh, we read about all the encounters that people have with just a glimpse of God in this physical life. God says, you can't take it. No man can see my face and live. Uh, no one can experience all of my glory. It would just overwhelm you. It's too much. But one day it will not be too much. In that day, that last great day, the glory of God will be fully known by those who have lived for God's glory, who have shared uh, the glory that God gave to them and living for the purpose that He created them for. Does that describe you tonight? God is glorious. It's a big word, a big Bible word, but one that I love to study about and want to know more about even than what we've been able to consider tonight. And you're welcome to share uh, your thoughts and your uh, studies with me on how you understand it to even deepen and better and improve mine. We'll do that together and one day I look forward to that time when we can experience it together. The glory of God, won't that be wonderful indeed? And again, how terrible it would be to miss out on that glory, to miss out on the glory of God for eternity. Uh, I don't know. It's of interest to me. Uh, again, just uh, this happened to come to mind. This wasn't in my uh, prepared thoughts. But uh, you remember in Luke chapter 16, when both the rich man and Lazarus die, uh, that uh, familiar um, account that Jesus gives us there. Uh, the Bible says that the rich man is in torment. And yes, he asked for just a drop of water, we remember. And again, we say that was bad. But have you ever thought maybe added to that, again, agony that he experienced, he's able to see what he missed out on. He's able to see Lazarus. He's able to see all of that glory and have no access to it. Uh, let Lazarus come back. No, there's a great gulf. There's a barrier. There's no going here to there. Neither you to us, neither us to you. Sorry, that time uh, is no longer available for you to make preparation. But tonight it is. So tonight, the glory of God, have you understood just a little bit more about it? I pray that you have, and uh, maybe if you have, you, you want to access it in your life. God has made you with that glory, the ability to reason and know Him and to respond to Him in obedience. Uh, believe in Jesus as your Savior. Know what He did on your behalf. Uh, confess your faith and show it by being identified with Him, baptized with Christ, buried with Him so that as you're raised to walk in newness of life, your sins are washed away. We'll help you do that tonight, and what a glorious thing that would be. Every time we read in the book of Acts of those who take those steps of obedience, there's always rejoicing, there's always happiness, there's always glory, because God's work of salvation is seen. And maybe tonight will be the night when someone uh, even allows us to have that experience of glory. If as a child of God, you're not living in a way that you know you should, that previous chapter, just one chapter before in Luke 15, Jesus talked about lost things, you remember. And those lost things when found, especially the first two, that coin and that sheep, Jesus said there is joy, there's rejoicing, there's glory in the presence of the angels of God when a sinner repents, even but one. Maybe tonight that is your need as well. The glory of God, if you need to respond there too, let us help you do that and come as we stand and sing together. <laughs>